Ken is a native of Columbus and a graduate of Emory University. He's been the weekly genealogy columnist for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution since 1977. He's a frequent lecturer on history and genealogy, especially on DNA testing for genealogical research. From 1973 until his retirement in 2006, he worked as the Historian to Historic Preservation Division of the Georgia Department of Natural Resources, which is a mouthful, working with the National Register of Historic Places. So everyone, please help me in welcoming Ken Thomas. It's good to be here today, and I hope everybody here has, uh, can hear. Can anybody hear? Okay, has everybody got a handout? All right, now the handout's useful. It's also to take home and study. Don't just stick it in a file. Look it over so you know what's there. A lot of the lecture is outlined on the handout, and a, few th a lot of things on the lecture are not on the handout. Okay, so I've been doing DNA for the last nine years. When a cousin showed up, it was kin to my family that I didn't know who she was. So you have a lot of surprises with DNA, and you have to take that a grain of salt and help people if you wish to help them and also to see how DNA is going to help you. So this talk is not a beginner's class. It's divided in two sections, case studies for each one of the genealogy, three DNA tests, and the new things for each company. And at the very end of the lecture, we'll talk about uh, briefly about the companies that are trying to extract, extract, extricate DNA from stamps and hair. Hold your questions to the end. Make a note ahead of time. It's got a lot of stuff here. We'll try to get enough time to lecture. I mean, to talk with some questions at the end. Um, wait a minute. Push the wrong button. OK, there are three types of DNA tests. For family tree DNA, they offer all three. They offer the mitochondrial DNA test, which is your mother's, mother's, mother's matrilineal line all the way back through time. The Y DNA test is your father's, father's, father all the way back through time. And the autosomal tests are offered by all five major DNA companies. Ancestry and 23andMe have the spit test. You cannot transfer your, your DNA results into the Ancestry or 23andMe. You have to take that test separately. If you take your test at Family Tree DNA, Living DNA, and My Heritage DNA with a cheek swab, then you can copy those over to one of these other sites. It's not easy. It's not totally free, but there is a way to do it. It's, it's not hard. It's just not easy. OK, the mitochondrial test is one we rarely ever talk about, so I decided to start off with this one because I haven't in my other talks. Again, it's the direct natural linear line. You have to find it's from a female relative, so you could be me, but then before me, it'd be all my female direct maternal line. Your mother's mother's mother, depending on what you're trying to prove or verify, it can be a useful test. It's worth certainly having on file in case uh, you need it in the future. And we also ne never know with any of these tests what they're going to come up with in the future. So right now we only deal with the testing that's available, but we have no idea what they may uh, dream up uh, down the line. And that's why you want to be sure to test the living relatives because they may not be living when the next test comes along and you want to have their DNA available. Just like my mother passed away at 99 a couple of years ago. I've got her DNA on two sites and transfer it to a third. Sometimes finding the candidate for a metrolino test can be the hard part. I'm going to show you how we did this on several of the, the examples I've got here. Um, but if you need them, you got to find them. And if this test is only offered at Family Tree DNA, and uh, their bargain discounts, remember they're going to be discounts. Uh, well, the Columbus Day is tomorrow. I haven't seen a Columbus Day discount, but there'll certainly be discounts uh, by Thanksgiving, Christmas. They come up with discounts on all the sites. So if you're going to do a major test that costs you 40 to $50 or $100, if you do the mitochondria test, be sure to look for uh, the, the, the bargains. And on the mitochondria test, the only one that really matters is the most expensive one, of course, the full sequence test. If you test lower than that, you're not going to have as good results. So this is the one great proof that has come forth on my mitochondrial. And this was an accident. My ancestor, Sarah Saunders Welburn, lived at the Troop Factory outside of LaGrange. It's right near Pine Mountain. It's a cotton factory. She had a whole parcel of children and grandchildren with not very clear who was the mother and father of some of these kids. It's a major study in my illegitimacy talk. So Sarah died in the 1850s, and my grandmother's grandmother was her child. 
And that's the descent on the on this side is showing my descent from Sarah. So a friend of mine who's whose grandmother, ancestral grandmother, was also at the Troop Factory living two doors away, uh, Professor Dan Knight, who's from LaGrange, uh, he said, well, I'm going to test this lady to see if she's on my line. But if she doesn't show up on my line, she will be kin to you. So lucky me, I didn't spend any money. So he, it turns out his, his test lady, Deborah, descends from Martha Sanders Deloach, the sister of my ancestors. By these two DNA matches, their match matching my match, then that verified all of my research back to Sarah Sanders Wellman, who was born in 1802 in North Carolina, and moved to Georgia when she was a teenager and married in Georgia. So that was a great find. Mitochondrial DNA is not as easy to understand, so you could be matching someone a lot further back before you have a common ancestor. But to have this done was a great proof, and it showed if you strategize what you're doing, you may find something you can really use. And this was extremely helpful to me. And I've worked on the mitochondrial line back to it. It's around the Raleigh, North Carolina area, going back to her mother was a driver. Miss Driver's mother was an Alford and a feral. I've gone back that far. In, um, but, you know, the proof on, on the records is a little bit more difficult. Um, this just shows you what it looks like at the DNA site. That's the lady. And you have to add this information, the identifying information about the you know, earliest known ancestor. You have to put that in. That doesn't come up anywhere. So this is what the guy added after I matched uh, his his uh, test taker, Deborah, just so it'd be real clear. It's interesting, the guy right above us has a Sanders ancestor. So he may be in the same Sanders family, but uh, his information online didn't give us any clarification. And if you look carefully enough, you'll see on family tree DNA, how these other people, they have taken the family finder test, which is the other one. Some of these people have a tree, that one has a tree. And here is where I put in notes where I've done research. So you have all those options. So be sure that you take advantage on any of these sites of all the various uh, things you can do to make sure you, you're keeping track on your own stuff. So the next case is uh, experimental. My ancestor is Phoebe Barbie, who was, died in Orange County, North Carolina, 1836. I descended from her twice. Her daughter came to Columbus, Georgia, and is my ancestor twice over. So to figure out how we're going to figure out what her maiden name is, I said, let me track down a female, direct female descendant of hers. And it turned out when you went back and looked, I had a number of people I knew were her direct female line descendants. So I decided to pick one that had already done DNA testing, so she couldn't say she was horrified by DNA or something like that. Do better with somebody that's already tested as long as their DNA will be the one you can use. And so a year ago, we got the results. I've written this up slightly in the Georgia Genealogical Society Quarterly, where I did an article about the mitochondrial DNA uh, that came out in the last year or so. And so the red star here shows where Phoebe lived outside of Raleigh. And this is where the lady that she's matched the most, and we have when I, the top match she had, and she, that lady had done a tree. So I got in touch with her because the tree didn't go back that far. And you only look at the female ancestor, the mother's mother's mother. It's the only part you're looking at. So it led me back to this Brunswick County, Virginia, on the Virginia, North Carolina line, which is uh, migration wise, makes good sense that Phoebe's ancestors would have come that route. Now, we hadn't got the answer yet, but we certainly got some people. And it just depends on how much intense work you're going to do to see what you can sort out. And of course, the ancestral, the mito, the most recent common ancestor could be much further back, but it's telling you a good chance of where to go. And it, since we had nothing to go on before, this is at least a clue. But again, I had to pay for the test, track down the lady who's in Arizona, and I had actually met her, met her mother for sure. She was a fairly close uh, family friend relative, and so she had no problem taking the test. Of course, I paid for it, so people don't have much of a problem if you pay for it. <laughs> Now, so then I said on the other line, my Parkers, and I wrote this Parker stuff up in the genealogical article before I discovered this, but I thought, well, how am I going to find a descendant? Because in the Parkers, my ancestor, James Parker, came to Houston County, Georgia before the Civil War. He died there in the early 1850s. He had one daughter, who was my ancestor, who came on to Columbus. So there's only one female descendant of his wife. And the fact that you had to track down a female direct line from this lady, I thought, how long are we going to do that? I had no clue. Well, we did know uh, her daughter, Stella. We called her Stella Roberts. She was my great-grandmother's first cousin. Well, I knew about her, had her family Bible copy. So when you look on fruit lines on ancestry, believe it or not, there was a direct female lady there, Connie. I don't know Connie. 
but I'm going to certainly get in touch with Connie and see if she'll agree to do a mitochondrial test to see if we can't determine anything about Mrs. Parker, who we know nothing about. I don't even know her first name, except they came out of Cumberland County, North Carolina. It's possible she never came to Georgia at all because her daughter, my ancestor, was born 1814. So Mrs. Parker, the only clue we've got on this family is that there are three people in the family, different branches of her descent that have the name Clifford. So is that just by random sampling or was Clifford one of the family names? So that just came up when you look. That's why on Ancestry.com, if you have your DNA there, you should have your DNA there and you should have your family tree there so you can have a through lines chart come through. And I had no idea this many people had tested. The last time I looked several years ago, um, I only knew this guy here, Dan, who lives in New Hampshire. I know him and these others, you know, different other relatives. So the point is, check your through lines, see what your goal is going to be. What are you trying to prove? And um, do the best you can to, to strategize and get the right person involved. And this lady, Connie, may be interested. She may know nothing. But you know, it's worth tracking her down and seeing. OK, the next test is the Y DNA test, which is the men. I've taken that test on my paternal line. And some of y'all have heard my lectures before know that my grandfather was adopted by his stepfather. So Thomas is not our ancestral line. So you have to find someone that's a direct male descendant. Now, if someone's adopted looking for their father, this is a must. And this is the only place you can take the test is on family tree DNA. But this is a must. And one of the guys in Columbus I spoke about last year when I spoke about adoption, he immediately took the Y test and, and got a major hit on who his father's family was and has met those people. Uh, of course, if you don't have a male in your family with a surname you're trying to trace, then you need to find someone, a male cousin. And uh, don't let it slip away from you. Some people say they don't we need to find somebody. I'm going to show you in the Harrison family in a minute how far apart we're going to get to finding the next relative. So I've done this with my own line, the Humphreys line. My, my, my grandmother was a Russell. I'll show you the Russell example. Uh, my grandmother Thomas was a Harrison, and I've got a we're working on that test. And then the Knott family is a line that came up when I was working on a Jamestown Society application. And we were hoping to get a result from Mr. Knott, but Mr. Knott has suddenly vanished. <laughs> he won't reply, so we don't know what his results were. But we're thinking Mr. Knott did not get the results he wanted. And therefore, he's becoming incommunicado. We don't know how to reach him. You know, we could send them, you know, who to knock on the door and say, why well, haven't you replied? But so far, we're letting Mr. Knott mellow out. On the Humphreys test, it was my paternal grandfather, born in 1893, who was to a single mother, Vina Hoyle. After she married in 1902 to Jack Thomas, then she uh, gave all her three earlier children the name Thomas. When my great aunt wrote me a letter in 1964 or five, she never mentioned that. She just sort of covered it up. And since the early 60s, late 60s, I knew the name Thomas was not our ancestral name. I didn't get the suggested answer to 1992. Even if we'd never had a suggestion, DNA, if you presume DNA was coming along, we would have had some suggestions at that point. But we had an interview with a cousin in 92. He said the family name was Humphreys, that the his grandmother's earlier a paramour had been an Humphreys. So I did the DNA test in 2005, got good results in 06. And by that time, I'd sort of researched around and figured out which line it was from the place these people live, which was on the North Carolina line, Rutherford County, North Carolina, Spartanburg County, South Carolina, and their successive division counties. So this is how my chart of ancestry, uh, I'm excuse me, well, you take the Y test on family tree DNA, but you want to see who else might have shown up on uh, Ancestry. So these are the people that come through the Humphreys line uh, on uh, through lines at Ancestry. And you'll see how many people have shown up just verifying that you're related to these people on the autosomal test. So the second one is just the Perry Humphreys. That turns out to be my great grandfather's father. And I descend from a man named Daniel M. Humphreys, but he went by the name Munn, and that was part of the family interview. You don't know somebody's middle name, nickname, unless you're intimate with them, because that was something that was not any public record. And so by, by all these other matches on the Humphreys line showing up, you know you're on the right path, because you wouldn't match these people um, if you weren't. And then on the Russell family, we're going to come back to the Humphreys when we get to the family tree DNA. 
On the Russell family, my grandmother was born, my, grand, my great grandfather was born in Eufaula to an unwed mother. And he said his father was the guy named uh, Clinton Russell from Eufaula. So to verify that story, I took my, the guy at the top here is my late cousin, Joe Russell in Columbus. So he clearly took the DNA test without any trouble. And then I had to track down the ancestor's brother there were no other, there were no legitimate Russells in the, the direct line of the man of the ancestors. So I had to go up the line to his brother, who was born in the 1820s, who had moved to Arkansas. And I'd corresponded with the people. So I tracked the descendants down in Arkansas and found this guy who looks like the goat man, but he's actually younger than me. And he, uh, he agreed to take the test. And in um, whatever year this was, he did take the test and he matched exactly genetic distance of zero to my cousin in Columbus. So that very well clarified that the Russell line was the same line because he was definitely a legitimate descendant of the uh, people we're talking about. So the next project I'm trying to do on the Y test is my great great grandfather's Harrison family. And he's in uh, outside of Charlotte and the next county over is where on paper we sort of verified that the same it's the same family. So the people I've met through DNA on uh, in Rowan County, the next county up, that's uh, Salisbury, North Carolina, uh, they've got somebody willing to take the test. This sort of got delayed during the pandemic because we just couldn't meet these people. But I, my, my own great grandfather's family, um, his lineage, even though he had three sons, two or three sons, anyway, he had sons and grandsons, they all died off without having issues. So the only person left right now Several of them died early as a 15 year old, maybe 17 by now. So to track down a minor to get to first meet him to get his permit, mother's permission to let him get tested since he's a minor is like complicated. So then I decided to switch over. My grandfather was the youngest of 16, my great grandfather. And so this is his half brother from his, uh, his excuse me, his full brother from his father's second marriage. And he had, he had five older brothers. So there's bound to be some wide DNA out there somewhere. You can see from these pictures that they clearly are brothers. They have the same look about them, but I assure you it's two different men. So uh, members of this guy's family have already tested, so we just got to find the right person to try to motivate to be tested. And that should verify the line. If it verifies the line of the Harrisons being to the ones in Rowan, we can trace the Rowan County Harrisons back to St. Mary's County, Maryland. So that's another project. So you got to strategize, figure out how you're going to find the person to test. You don't want to get it to be too complicated. Anybody that's, but you got to ask them too, are you adopted? Is anybody in the direct line adopted? You don't want to. And when I'm going back to the 15 or 17 year old, I need to ask that as a question. Is this guy, you know, I don't want to spend my money. And then somebody said, oh, well, you need it was adopted. One person did get around it almost being tested. And he said, well, why are you testing me? I'm adopted. You know, you got to have some sense. Okay, so that's some of the tests I've got pending. Uh, before you do a Y DNA test, you need to look at family tree DNA and see the group projects that are available, because there you'll learn a lot more about who's tested, how they've been grouped, and what kind of uh, information might be available to them already. And of course, the group administrator, if they will respond to you, which is not always clear. Well, one thing to remember, this talk is going to be is taped. It's going to be on YouTube in a week on the Archives YouTube channel. So you can all watch it again if you miss something. It'll be free on YouTube in about a week. Um, then we look at the, I'm going to show you some group project stuff in a minute. For the Harrison family, checking, I checked the Harrison group, and you'll see there in a minute. For the Knot project, uh, there's one key match we want to try to see if it's made, if it leads to Jamestown or not. So here's what, this is what the um, results look like for the Harrisons. This is how they, shirt, they stretch your DNA out on the Y-DNA group project. And over here, this is what they put in about the different Harrison matches. And none of these match what I'm looking for. So it could mean that nobody on our branch has tested, which is what I think it means. When I tested on another family and got the results, you know, help somebody get tested, somebody on that family had already tested, but they had not posted it anywhere. So I didn't know I could have saved my money because somebody else tested already. But if you don't know, you don't know. So here you can contact the group administrator and say, is anybody tested from, you know, Rowan County or Charlotte, North Carolina, North Carolina to see what's going on? Um, this is on the not project. And you see right here where I put the arrow. 
somebody's put down the knot that was at Jamestown as their purported ancestor. So if the guy I'm trying to get to test, if his DNA matched up in here, that would be helpful. But there are several of these. These are the separate groups of, from the Y DNA that do not match each other. So that's one, two, three, four different groupings of, of the knot family that are not kin to each other. So that's what you got to realize that that's what the group administrator does. The national administrator groups people by DNA matches. Okay. Well, my friends, the Atkinsons, they did their Y DNA test, and this just shows you the name variations. Uh, we talked to one guy earlier who says he hasn't matched yet anybody with his surname or any variation of the spelling. You need to, you need to know how your name is translated. You know, even if you don't think it's a foreign language, see if it translates any way into some other word. Um, this guy, the Axton family, turns out four different spellings if you look carefully. Oh, genetic distance zero. Two spelled it out. These two men, who knows? Then you got it down here with ATK, ADK, and then Atkins. And whether Mr. Atkins realized that he's an Atkinson, who knows? But you can't get hung up on the spelling. As long as you, your DNA, your Y DNA matches something close to the name you're looking for, you're in the right ballpark. Which you could match, you could find out there's been a whole nother misadventure, as I call it, in your family tree. And you could match a totally different name. Um, that happens. If you're Jewish, you know, the Jewish people did not have patrilineal surnames, so they're not necessarily going to match any name. They're going to make hodgepodge all around the place because they didn't get names in the Russian Empire until around 1800. So many people just picked a name out of the blue. They, in African-American research, you don't know what kind of name, where the name came from. I've worked on some African-American families where the men took a last name, took as their last name, their first name in slavery, and just stuck what we call a Christian name in front of it. So who knows what that would show up if you did a Y-DNA test in an African-American situation. So you got to be available for everything that comes up. Certainly in my family, the Humphreys name is spelled a lot of different ways. You, you can't be hung up on spelling for sure. But do try to figure out the translation of what you, if your name is like Black or White or Smith or Jones, what is that name in another language, in another German or Italian or something else? See what comes up because it may help you a lot to know what's going on. OK, the autosomal test is the one that's off of all the sites. And everybody can take that test. And you need to just be aware of that. Um, I think it's very helpful to verify on your paper trail uh, using the autosomal test to figure out are you trying, have you got matches on all the different names you're kin to? Or do you have a blank? And so it took a long time for some of the branches of my family to show up with matches. And now, as I just showed you on the Parkers, a lot of people are out there that weren't there three or four years ago. The great chart that I referenced in the handout is the Blaine Bettinger shared CM, CM or Center Morgan project. That's very important because you get a Center Morgan number with your matches on autosomal DNA. And you need to know what relationship that offers for the person if you don't know who they are and how they fit in. That's his chart. And, and you really need to have a copy that's available in your research. This is another chart that was published recently using that, but sort of rearranging it on Family Tree magazine. And you can pull that up online for free. Can't say where, it just sort of popped up one day. But it's just a, sometimes a somewhat easier chart to look at. But you've got to realize your center mortgage can be varied depending on which direction you're going. So your, your great aunt could have the same center mortgage as your first cousin twice removed or something like that. You've got to know logic, essentially, what the person you're matching could possibly be. And this just shows you when you do your chromosome matches, chromosome browse at family tree DNA, one of the advantages it does sort of show you where on a certain chromosome of where your matches match and what this could mean. This lady, Kathy C., is on my great-grandmother's family out of Stanley County, North Carolina. And the people she matches with at the same spot on chromosome, whatever it is, 10, yeah, 18. This just shows you that they share the same chromosome. So that chromosome has to be part of the lineage of that family. And that's why you need to know that if anyone else, you don't know how their match shows up in that spot in chromosome 18. If you do your mix and matches, they're going to be on that same family. And it helps you sort people out if that's your goal is to figure out who the matches are and how they fit in. 
Uh, autosomal DNA, like I said, can help you um, certify some of the other people you've matched with before and how they fit in and whether people on certain branches of the family have uh, shown up and tested. But this is where I had a gap in my family. My great grandmother's father was unknown. She was another out of wedlock person born in 1881. And several years ago, I think it says five or six years ago, this uh, CB showed up and she was a very high match. She matched me at uh, 107 Cinnamorgans is shown up here on Ancestry. 107 Cinnamorgans is pretty high. It's, you know, if you knew them in your hometown, they might be at Thanksgiving dinner with you. I mean, they're, you know, they're close enough to know who they are. And so third cousin, closer. So this lady actually was tend to be twice, but the point is she was, her father was a honeycut. And she had the whole honeycut family tree laid out and my, her mother had done a book. So after I met with her, this is the picture of her. When I met with her on the way back from a meeting, it just paid off because, you know, we got to know somebody a little bit better to deal with them. And so the point is that uh, it led me to the Honeycutt name. And when I got the book on the left there that her mother had written, it, it clarified a lot because I was having a lot of North Georgia matches. And I said, well, I don't have any North Georgia relatives, you know. But it turns out a whole bunch of the Honeycutts and their related folks, the Kegels, you know, Kegels, a big family in North Georgia. They all came down from North Carolina. So I was matching a lot of these people that were part of the same family that I had no idea why I was matching them. They had moved down from North Carolina. So it turned out a number of the matches I could figure out from this book, how they fit in the tree on the honeycuts. But the big thing that came up, and I didn't put it in this slideshow, my ancestress who had the child in 1881, by 1880 census, she had already sold the farm of her parents who'd been sold at the estate sale. But when you look back at the estate sale, and, and, and the, the, the next door farm was Mr. Honeycutt, one of the men in this family. And in the estate sale itself, Mr. D.C. Honeycutt was in line next to her. So he clearly was a next door neighbor. He knew my great great grandmother. He also had a child with her sister in law. He was a married man. He wasn't real available to marry any of these people. So he just had children with him. And so DNA has pointed the way that that's the, the father of my great grandmother. Could be his brother, but since he was the one right there on the spot, we're claiming him right now. I did put a query in the local genealogy journal. That's what this is here. I published this. Uh, Six years ago, I heard from nobody. You try your best and some people never reply. And so nobody in that county had the time to say anything. And they're bound to, they're plenty of honeycuts there, but nobody wrote back at all. Um, so we did that. So that's just one success story using the autosomal DNA. And you could have others come up. You just have to be careful and be prepared uh, to see what you can learn. Um, Autosomal is done through five DNA companies. We have them here, Ancestry, Family Tree DNA, Living DNA, which is probably not known to many of y'all, MyHeritage, and 23andMe. This is a chart that's not very legible. It just shows how they, they point out which test can be copied over to the other company. Uh, it's not I'm just updated because Living DNA just suddenly added the chromosome on browser in the last 30 days. Um, Anyway, that just shows you how you can compare the chart the companies. And then this is another chart showing uh, every company has ethnicity results. And a lot of people get real hung up over ethnicity. And, oh, I've got 20% Italian and 5% Portuguese. Psh. Mine, I'm going to show you mine in a minute. They change all the time. And since you just updated theirs this week, you know, I, I lost my finish. I keep losing Finland every now and then. Now, I'm now back to Denmark and Sweden, which, of course, right next to Finland. Um, I have German ancestors. My great grandmother was from German stock. You'll see my little map. No Germans ever shown there. Why is that? Anyway, this just shows you that what you can learn from the different charts and the prices are irrelevant because they've changed the prices all the time. Plus, they have these bargains and you ought to just wait to, to join with a bargain test. Um, We'll go through each one of the tests and show some of those main points. To remember, this is the number of matches. The number of matches is important if you're trying to see across the board uh, who you might be related to or help find some of the missing relatives on some of the branches you hope have some information. You always hope you're going to match somebody that's going to know something that you need to know that you don't already know in your uh, research. But 
unfortunately, a lot of people just never respond. Uh, they can't tell you doodly squat. Or maybe they don't know what they know. This just shows you that my test results at the end of September. I was right close to post, close to 70,000 matches. They now divide it if you're a paying member between maternal and paternal ancestors, and they have both sides. 142 people can't match both sides of my family, and my sister and I are the only two that would be both sides. So that's a big question. And then they have unassigned. That's how they can't figure out in the ancestors' algorithms who these people match. You can go through one by one and match them to your father or your mother. But the big parts of the ancestors' DNA is the story, the DNA story, the DNA matches, the through lines, the traits, which I got some updated traits the other day, which are also useless, and then the DNA surveys. They've also added a fan chart. So now you can click on uh, in your pedigree, you can click on a fan chart, which is interesting. You can sort of see on that what you might have missed if you didn't put all the data down. And you can click on any one of the pieces of the fan chart and get a fan chart of further back. And so this just shows you the latest. I've been working on my Carter line out of Virginia, and this shows how far back I've got them on the tree. If you put them on the tree on Ancestry, this is all from your tree. And you can just see where you are and where, and you might realize you've left off some people that you haven't, uh, you haven't put them on your tree for whatever reason. So that's a new feature. Um, they now divide the results between your parents. And because I have my mother's DNA, it's much easier to see. Uh, I know exactly what my mother's DNA shows, and they have divided between mother and father. Uh, this is for paying members only. Um, so I mentioned before, unassigned matches. You can sort of, have, sort of sort those out and see if they're really, uh, if you know where they are, the groups feature. I'll show you in a minute. You can create 21 groups there, and you can help sort out your ancestors or your matches by putting people in different groups. And then you can study those groups in case you need to contact anybody. That's a good way to point when you find out who somebody is to sort the group out and say, well, here's where to put them. And for the people in Stanley County, North Carolina, where my great grandmother's from, I just got real confused because there were so many people in there I was kin to that I didn't know how they fit in. I just put them in Stanley County, North Carolina. I mean, it created a geographic group to throw them all in. So I didn't have to really figure out anything except that's where they were from. Because my father and my mother both have answers in Stanley County. So it's doubly confusing. So I just create a group for that. So you you got 21 options of creating groups. And then of course the through lines, which has come is made, is created from your uh, tree. If you don't have a tree, you won't get a through lines. Then this is um, this is one of the ethnic profiles before they updated me this week. So I have England and Northwestern Europe. Well each parent's divided up and then it says I have 44%. Then I have Scotland 35%. Wales, where the Umphrey's line comes from, by the way, 16%. And then Sweden and Denmark, 5%. Okay. And then this is my map from the day before yesterday. Notice nothing from Germany, a little bit of Spain. Uh, well, anyway, it's all irrelevant. It's just something they like to do. And a lot of people are doing the DNA testing for this. And so when you write somebody and say, oh, I'd like to know about the person you match with, they don't give a hoot because all they want to know is about ethnicity. It's a cocktail party discussion, you know, chit chat, but it's not going to help you at all. Now, my brother-in-law is full Polish. All four grandparents came from Poland. His map is all Polish, pretty accurate. But um, some people don't get that accurate. Um, this is how I created the groups on Ancestry. These are the top, the top ones alphabetically, but they're for my great great grandparents. I created group name, giving the name of the couple, the two surnames. So then I marked, and there's my mother, and I put her in all the groups she belongs to. Of course, my sister gets all of them because she's my sister. So you match people up, and it just helps you sort people out. And so this is just one of the features you've got. So don't, don't miss out on doing that. And you can be as creative as you want to. Uh, this is some of the newer things or new to me. Um, just showing the ways that the, when you're, when you're a family tree, how you get notices. The, uh, this shows a DNA match here, and my mother's got the DNA thing. Um, this tells you how they're related to you. That's a feature called relationship. This means you've got a comment. So if you've done anything, it really groups it up. And I do have my sister's DNA, but somehow the DNA link did not. Uh, did not show up there. We don't know what happened there. 
But just remember that lots of things on answer. And I mentioned all this in the chart, I mean, on the handout, where to look for. It. And then the through lines people gave a message the other day about how to enhance your through lines to go back and look at your chart. Be sure you got some in your tree to be sure you got stuff in there. One thing they don't say, if you've got a family name that spells differently, like Umphreys, you need to have a different answer to spell a different way because you will not match somebody if they spell Umphreys the other way if you don't have an ancestor in your chart spelling in a different way. So don't be too strict construction. Go back in and do that. I did that on the Nolan thing. N-O-L-A-N for one ancestor. N-O-L-E-N, N-O-L-I-N, N-O-L-A-N-D. So that you've got all the options in there. And then you match more people. Uh, the three lines. Okay. Um, if your tree has bad data, you will match bad data. Uh, you'll still match the right people, but you could both have the wrong person on your tree. Uh, notice the hints. Be careful of the hints. A lot of people make trees up with all the garbage that answer to throws out you uh, with hints. So be careful. If you've researched somebody, the hints can be great. It just helps you verify stuff you've already learned, but don't just put a hint on there. You can't imagine some of the crazy stuff people have on a tree. Uh, two children born in Georgia, one born in Boston, Massachusetts, one born in Texas, because they look at hints, some stupid stuff. You can take the hint out. You can correct things, but a lot of people never go back. The dotted lines on a through line, I'll show you in a minute, means that you haven't put them on your tree, but they're on the, the DNA matches tree. So that means they've got them on their tree, and you need to put them on your If you know they're true, put them on your tree. But you still match the person that's a descendant. Um, anyway, just be careful and don't overdo it. And... Um, Sometimes, like I said a while ago, I found a match on the person I wanted to contact with only because they matched on three lines. I would have never been able to track them down without a lot of trouble. So three lines can really guide you to some of the living people. Uh, be sure when you look at your three lines tree or when you make a printed chart that you look at the ancestors that are on your tree. Because if you do all ancestors at the top, that's everything everybody else has thrown out. That your various matches have thrown out, that they've just dreamed up as your ancestors. So you want to make sure you do the middle line ancestors from your own tree to get your what you've actually researched and can verify. Uh, this is the ancestral trait, so they've gifted me now free to my account. And I want you all to look at these. They have <laughs> dancing, a picky eater. I am a picky eater. Something about asparagus. Who cares? You know. So they think that's worth paying money for. All right, uh, when you go to Family Tree DNA, don't miss out on all these reports they do. This is something I just got an email about, but there's quite a bit of reporting on there, different uh, position papers you can look at that explain a lot of the parts of Family Tree DNA. They also have a lot of blogs on there. This is just part of the chart of the blogs. I was astonished how much they had on there that you don't really notice if you just plug in on looking at your DNA. You need to look at the rest of the site and study it. Sometimes you look at it on your cell phone, you'll see a list of everything they've got that you don't really see on the main site because on a cell phone it's concentrated. So you might want to look on that to see the options. Um, here's the chromosome browser. Uh, they were the one of the first ones to have it. So I put in the men that are on there. They just happen to be all men. And two of the men only for, on the Russell Hudson family, two of them are only Hudson descendants. So they have no Russell blood in them at all. And two of them are both Russell and Hudson. And you notice how they all match on chromosome 11. Well, we have one woman at the bottom, Carol. So the point is that's, a, that's the indicator. This has to be the Hudson chromosome because two of these people are not Russells at all. So if you're trying to divide up your family on chromosomes, this is a good point. So somebody that shows up, they, they don't know how they fit, if they match the chromosome 11, it is, they've got to be somehow in the Hudson family. One of these matches lives in Oregon, and we had never heard of him until he matched and we realized who he was, and I got in touch with him. And after much investigation, he finally, well, yeah, my mother was a Hudson. Don't you think you sort of asked, answered that first? <laughs> His family went to Oregon by, via Mexico, by the way. Okay, so this is another part of the family tree DNA. Um, when you're linking them on the other side, well, this is the uh, on the family tree, the actual tree part where you put the tree on, and then it asks you to match on the tree all the different people you match in the other testing. You would have to add them to your tree, and then you can say they're a Y DNA match or a mitochondrial match. Um, 
that's a lot of work, but it's worth doing if you want to show that. Uh, these are family tree DNAs updates. They now have a multi kit management agreement that you need to look into because if you've got the DNA that you're managing for someone else, you need to be very careful to fill out what they want so that you don't lose access to it. We're not sure what this means. It came up earlier this year. On the Y-DNA test, there's a group time tree check. I'm going to show you that in a minute. And there's also a tip report that's a new advanced version they claim it. They have a chromosome painter. It's not the same as I'm going to show you here in a minute, the, the Johnny Pearl's DNA painter. This is on ethnicity results. And don't forget the help tab on all these things because the help tab has lots of stuff on it. And you might uh, learn a lot if you just look at the help tab. Help, H-E-L-P. This is the tip report, and this shows you when you maximize Y DNA, this just shows you the, the, the approximate generation on, on the Humphreys line. It just says here that the first time match, this is actually colored in on the actual chart, is matches me somewhere between 1650 and 1900 AD, which is, you know, back to the American Revolution and, and beyond. But with back to the American Revolution is our common ancestor. So that's somewhat useful and just the more expanded version of this. This is the um, ethnicity thing they've done lately there. I put ancestry and family tree at the same chart here just to show the, the way they're trying to designate things with different colors and different designations. It's hard to tell much of anything there, but I'm just saying they're both trying their best to make it easy. Living DNA is not one that a lot of people know about. It's, it's supposedly based in England, but they don't want you to say that. I only have 892 matches, not very many, whereas I have 70,000 on Ancestry. You're welcome to look at it. Are they, some of the matches there are brand new people that don't match anywhere else. I only found two names I recognized. Uh, you can see my little, my little chart there. It shows me mostly England. So I guess if you're English, they don't care about Denmark and Sweden and Finland and all that. Um, this is my chromosome browser. I had to pick the one lady I recognized, the same Kathy I had on another DNA site. And these are the people she matched with at, um, in showing the chromosome overlap there on chromosome 18. Remember, it was chromosome 18 before. So both these DNA tests both say that the honeycut DNA is chromosome 18, which is where this lady comes from. So it just shows some new people that I did not know about. They may or may not have tested other places, but they're worth pursuing if you want to figure out this lineage. On the MyHeritage site, um, they have a lot going on there. This is my mother, DNA. And um, the thing I'm pointing to next is what they show in the DNA tools they have there. They have the um, chromosome browser, their version of it, in auto clusters. And then when you get to the chromosome browser, again, you have to select the people to match. Again, these are the same Russell people I used before, but here they are matching on this site. And all three of these are actually Russells, not Hudson's. So it looks like chromosome eight there is going to be uh, is where the Russell lineage comes in. And they have a thing called the theory of family relativity. And they offer it for if you're paying a little bit better than the basic fee, which I'm paying, which means I'm not paying anything uh, extra. All these sites have an extra tier to go to. And you just got to be careful to see if you want to experiment. Maybe a Christmas present might be paid me the next tier up. But um, this is one of our cousins on very close relative. He's never gotten in touch with me. I don't know why he doesn't do that, but I've never been in touch with him either, but I know him, I know his family. But this shows that uh, he's my grandmother's first cousin's descendant. So it just shows that people match you, though. And then this is the theory of relativity on someone else's family. Just show you get a little family chart. So if they've got a tree and you've got a tree, it sort of tells you how it matches or if your DNA is in there. So you don't learn a lot from this that you may not already know. You just have to know your family tree, folks. If you don't know anything at all, you're going to be really lost on any of these sites. You've got to have enough outline of your family to know something when you get into this. This is their auto clusters. Uh, auto clusters show up on several sites. You'll see another one in a minute. I'm not sure how useful this is going to be. It's real pretty. Then on 23andMe, which a lot of people join because they get advertised on TV and they have a health thing and big deal. I had the health thing first and I thought, this is very depressing. I don't need to know all this. So I just didn't look at it. I already knew I had diabetes. That was the first thing they said. Well, how did they figure that from my DNA? But 
Maybe I had it in my DNA because I did inherit it from my great grandmother. So anyway, the top matches there. I know who these people are. Uh, Brooks family. My mother was a Brooks. So these are kin on the Brooks family. These three different people here. Um, they have a convoluted way of writing people, but people have to accept the fact that you want to write them. So most people there never write back. I don't think I've ever had anybody write back on on 23andMe. Oh, uh, wait a minute. I'm going ahead of myself. So this is how you compare the, the DNA segments on that site. And again, you here you see these two people are clearly related, but they don't show. There's a match right here in chromosome three with these two cousins who are fairly high cousins. 174 centimeters, 152. They they match right there on chromosome three. These are two separate chromosomes, so that's not a match down there. So you just have to study what you're learning because if you know how kin how they're kin to you, this just verifies that they are blood relatives. Okay, these are third party testing companies. We have GEDmatch, which is the most famous, and then DNA Painter. Uh, GEDmatch. Uh, I'm, there's a place to go and it tells you how to transfer your results into GEDmatch. You have to transfer into GEDmatch. It's not automatic. This is the one the law enforcement people are using. But again, if you, you transfer in there, you sign a document saying, I want to do this. This is my chart. I have my mother's DNA in here and the privacy thing. When I looked at this other day, I changed the privacy to open so they can use our site to check out people if they want to. You get a bunch of free tools. And then they have a paid section called Tier 1. Well, there's a whole other slew of things in Tier 1. So you, you match a bunch of people there. This is where you get people's DNA from all the different sites can transfer in here, copy in there. But you got to do it voluntarily. You can't, it's not going to be automated. You got to go to Ancestry and say transfer here. And here it tells the test, some of the sort, this is a 23andMe test, these two people here. And over on the far left where there's the um, actual kit number, the pre- Prefix number tells you what company they, tra they transfer it in from. So um, I copy my mother's in from family tree DNA here. It was long before I did her ancestry DNA. But anyway, it gives you the Cinemorgan numbers. And I picked a lady named Ms. Lee. She was a fairly high match here coming in from 23andMe. And I did not know how she, how she matched. So that's what we were sorting out on the next sort. And I, I put a star there by the people I knew who they were. So that put me into whatever branch of the family she matches. And you see here my heritage, family tree DNA, and all the different options are there, people that have transferred in. Uh, Gen Match has tier one, which costs hundred dollars a year or thereabouts. And this is all the new things they've got on that. So just remember there are a lot of options there, depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, this is their tool on the tier one called relationship prediction. This helps you figure out who the person is if you don't know. This is their version of the auto clusters. I'm not sure what it tells us. Uh, DNA Painter, this is a really fun site. It's free for the first grouping and then it's, uh, you have to pay if you want to do more than one uh, group chromosome map, they call it. When you go to this site, you want to look at uh, Johnny Pearl, the developer. And the inventor of the site who has a lot of stuff online, a lot of YouTube things about this. You need to go listen to one or two of them to see what you're going on. Uh, he has a real good one called What's New at DNA Painter, um, the introduction to DNA Painter. But the, the main thing is you create a chromosome map. So what I had to do here, it's not hard to do because I did this on Friday a couple of weeks ago. I went back, I hadn't been to the site in several years, but you take one of your DNA results and you're supposed to pick a strong cousin. So if you have your family broken up, you may be your second cousin, some strong cousin that you know exactly where they fit in. You copy their DNA results. So you don't have to get their permission. You just copy it over. So here I've got a different branch of the family. Again, I've created groups. And so I've, I've brought them into this tree to show. This is just my father's side of the family, by the way. You're supposed to do it with both sides coming in the same. And I got lost and didn't do it that way. Okay, so at any rate, you get down here. The ladies that are... Uh, this happened to be ladies that are double blocked here. I didn't know where they fit. And and they, the, when you're doing this designation, they ask you which side the family is on. So that's sort of giving it away. Um, but they clearly have already matched people in my father's family and it shows them the chromosome they match on. So uh, this lady, Miss Snap, who I've been in touch with, she shows up 
this girl. Sometimes these colors are hard to tell. She's a green. Well, I know she's kind of the honey cuts we mentioned before. She matches all those people. Uh, although we can't trace it on paper, that's who she matches. And so down here, my Harrisons, the two different marriages of my ancestor, I've got a DNA match from each one. And they do match on this one chromosome here. So because it's two different wives, then it means this should be the Harrison DNA itself and not either one of the wives, unless the wives were kin to each other, which is also a conundrum. Anyway, if you want to do another branch of your family, you've got to pay to have a second map or erase that one and start over. So remember that. You get one map for free. There's all kind of other, excuse me, it's going haywire here. Something's happened here. Okay, folks. Uh, that's the chromosome map. And the, the last part of the lecture here, we're running a little late, is uh, can you get DNA from stamps or hair? How many people are interested in that question? Okay, how many people spent money? No one spent money. Good. Um, the lecture last weekend by Blaine Bettinger, he said, wait a while. Well, of course, you know, get your stuff together. He just said, wait a while because the companies haven't perfected yet. Two people we know in the DNA community in Georgia have spent the money uh, on stamp, having the DNA taken from a stamp from their ancestor, trying to get a result, spent some good money, and they were told by the company, let's just stop. We're not getting anywhere. So you want to be sure you have a good, clean sample. You're supposed to call the company and talk to them and see what they advise based on what you're telling. You can show it to them or send, send them a picture or something like that. Um, you can get it from an envelope, from hair, but if the hair is not taken out by the roots, unless you're on TV, you can't find anything. So a lot of this stuff on TV makes it look real simple. And with a lot of money, I think a lot more stuff can be done than what normal people will spend. Um, and then with what kind of DNA you're expecting. See, I think we're also led to believe that when you get this DNA, it's going to be what you want. And it may just be the same DNA you've already gotten from your your own self or your relative. So I always ask these questions. This is the price schedule for one company, keepsake DNA pricing. And if you look at the bottom, you're getting up into the two thousands of dollars for some of the stuff. So that's why you want to be really sure that you know what you're doing and trying to do it. Oh, the to the letter DNA.com is what two friends of mine, two separate people have done. And they were the ones that the company finally said, well, I don't think we're getting anywhere. Don't send us any more money. Let's just stop. So they both ended up with nothing. So I'll just give you a warning on that. And then the last thing we're talking is just this is going to be on YouTube, as I said before, and probably in the next week or so. Go back and look it over. It's a lot of stuff I've thrown at you. Look at your handout. And then you can get my email is on there on the handout. You can get in touch with me if you wish and ask some more questions. And now we'll have some questions. We're already way over time, but nobody left, so that's good. <laughs> Questions? Yes. I got one. Through lines. How accurate do you think through lines? So I, I got a lot of good. I believe that through lines, but I just wonder how accurate. You know, well, it's your stuff. It's your tree. It's your information. It's people, oh, they put that's that's why you only want to look at who's on your tree until you've checked it out. Yeah, they make suggestions, and unless you verify it, you don't know if they know what they're doing or not. But you match them. So well, they, they don't show what DNA. I know that you're matching them. However, they got to you, they're still matching their they DNA. They don't the DNA. Is that how they got people you match with on DNA? But the facts on the tree could be off oh, kilter. Well, their tree. Okay. Well, your tree too. You know, who knows where the tree is? I gave it. Lines question: Can ancestry put your DNA sample on more than one tree if you have two different trees? I don't know. Why don't we try it? Maybe I'll call them and ask. That'd be good to ask. I don't know that. I hadn't thought of that before. Uh, anybody else there? Is Miss Elliot? Did Miss Elliot come today? Is that you? Well, why don't you tell the group your question? This is Laura. She had a ethnicity question. Mm -hmm. 
But as I told her, you know, I showed you mine. No German shows up. David has no German on his. He's got lots of German roots. So sometimes it just doesn't work. I would suggest looking at some other sites. And again, if this is your father's direct male last name, he ought to do the Y DNA test just to see. That's the final the markation is if he shows up with an Italian name, whether it's his name or not, the original Italian name, then that tells you what's really going on. But it's hard to believe since the mother was Italian, whether the father was or not, the mother, the lady that birthed this child was Italian, right? So there ought to be some Italian in there. So this is a fluke, and it doesn't work out all the time. That's why you don't rely on these things. You can't join the DAR based on your ethnicity. Let's put it that way. You can't join anything and show them your ethnicity chart. You, you, I guess you might could join them. Maybe the Irish group or something, if they said one some kind of proof that you had Irish roots, but they could disappear. You could end up with Denmark. Who knows? Amy tree DNA. Well, you have to see who they match. That's why you have, you have, you have to have your standards. Like who is your cousin that they're going to match with? Like what branch of the family? That's why you do groups. Well, you don't know family tree DNA, but you could create a system where you say, who's your, like I did it on previous lecture, the four quadrants, your four grandparents. Who was a cousin on those side of the family? And who are these people going to match to let you know which side of the family they're on? That's one cut. And, and then you sort of have to write them and just hope. And sometimes with a full name, I know they don't reply, but look them up on Google. Look them up otherwise. I found some people just taking their name and doing a Google search and seeing if they show up um, in another fashion. Or well, if you've got their on family tree DNA, you have their email. You could also do a Google search on their email and see if you find them any other context. But we're all faced with the fact that people don't reply. So that's not that's not a, that's a normal thing. Does that help you at all? <laughs> well, I'm just saying it's it's a lot of us have that we just don't, you know, unless you have any way of knowing. And a lot of people could be adopted. You know, there could be a lot of reasons they're there. Some of them just not interested. I wrote a lady that had a real unusual three-part name. She never wrote back. I searched and found that name on on Google, somebody in Tennessee, and I said, well, I don't have any Tennessee cousins that I knew of. She was a fairly high rank. So I finally, about a year later, wrote her again. And she said, and then she wrote the whole family tree that I already knew. If she just told me that she was from Paris, Texas, I'd have known exactly where she fit in. I wouldn't have bothered with her because we have all those people. I have a 50-page letter from her grandmother. I knew exactly where everybody fit in. But see, why did she not reply the first time? Some people don't check their email, for one thing. Some people are using a separate email for these sites. And some people, you know, just not paying attention. Okay, folks. Well, I'll be around during lunch and during the rest of the afternoon if anybody wants to catch up with me. And I did bring some, some sample books to show you. They're not giveaways. If you want to come look at some of the DNA books, you're welcome to. Thank you.